It's the Honky Tonk Happy Hour coming to you live from the hideaway on Dunvale. I'm Chuck Savage. I'm a musician, a bass player, and I'm going to tell you something. I play country music in Texas, and right now, today, we have a guy with us today that is genuinely one of the working bass player musicians in the country scene in Texas and has been for over 40 years, and he's the real deal. And I'm very proud to introduce you guys to Bob Livingston. Oh, it's very nice to meet you. you. It's very nice to meet you. And I'm not Thank just you. saying that. I mean, I'm a musician. And, and guys like you that do what you've done are very inspirational to guys like me. You know? Well, we working for a living. That's what we do. I mean, it's just right off the bat, you know, the obvious thing everybody talks about is Lost Gonzo Band, where you yeah. guys were the backup band for both Michael Martin Murphy and Jerry Jeff Walker, right when it was happening in the yeah. 70s, when it all exploded and became the whole progressive country music. Can yep. you tell me what that feels like to look back on it now? And and you were there, you were the, you were in it, man. It was for real, you know? Well, you know, when I, I was a folky. I was a folk singer. Okay. And uh, I was from Lubbock. I grew up in Lubbock. And in 1969, I won the lottery. Uh, first draft lottery of 1969. <laughs> and uh, I was going to school at Texas Tech just to, you know, basically, Stay out of the draft. draft. Stay out of the school. war. You got a student deferment. Well, when I got number 309 in that lottery, I left school the next day. And I went to Red River, New Mexico, and uh, got a job working for drinks and tips as a folky. And uh, down the street, there was a little bar called the Outpost, and there was a group from Dallas called Three Faces West. It was Rick Fowler, Wayne Kidd, and Ray Hubbard. Hey, Wiley Howard. And when I saw them play, I knew what live music, what it was going to take to do live music. They were just fantastic. They were great musicians, did great songs, and really were hilarious. And they had the live show down. It just wasn't up there singing a song after song after song. It was funny, entertaining. They knew how to be entertaining. Totally entertaining. Right. They were entertainers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've always sort of followed that lead in a way in my shows. But uh, <clears throat> I went out to California to seek my fortune. I got a record deal on Capitol Records, mm -hmm. doing my own stuff. Uh, my deal fell through and ended up. But before that happened, uh, I remember I was driving down a LA freeway and I picked up a hitchhiker, turned out to be from uh, Germany, worked on foreign cars, and he said, the only other Texan I know is from Dallas. His name is Mike Murphy. He's a musician, too. Wow. And uh, that guy became the governor of California, but that's another story. <laughs> no, no, I wasn't. That's a right. corny joke. <laughs> Cheap <laughs> joke. But, Honk, uh, happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, I had known these Murphy songs from back in Texas. He had already written Wildfire by that time in right. Texas Morning. And so, we got in touch. He, he gave Murphy my number. Murphy called me up. We became friends. My record deal fell through. So did Murphy's. We decided there's only one thing left to do, and that's go back to Texas. And that was 1971. Okay. So we get back to uh, we moved to Austin, and by way of going to Nashville and recording an album called Geronimo's Cadillac. Right. That's that's and the it, debut album of Murphy. It was the de right? debut album of Murphy. Right. And it was on A&M Records, produced by Bob Johnson, the guy that produced Nashville Skyline, Blonde on Blonde, Flat and Scrubs, Live at Folsom Prison, George Jones Records. Big, big guy. Big guy. Big guy. And he just loved Murphy, and everything was one or two takes. Cut 25 songs in two days, just him and me. And then they came back in and overdubbed uh, bass and drums. And so suddenly, I was 21 years old and had played on this nationally released record wow. with Murphy. And we were touring everywhere. And um, Gary Nunn got in the band. Gary had always been a hero of mine uh, back in Texas, back in Lubbock. And he was in this band, the greatest rock and roll band in the history of the world called The Fabulous Sparkles. The Fabulous Sparkles. They were great. and. Um, Gary was uh, Gary just gotten in that band and he played the organ. So here was this great player and I, you know, used to go to the Village Swinger there in Lubbock in the Music Box, the two big clubs, and watch the Sparkles. And so imagine my complete chagrin and intimidation of being in a band with, with Gary, Gary Nunn. Nunn. Right. He was he wasn't even Gary P Nunn. Yet. He was just Gary Nunn. He was just Gary Nunn, but still that was enough right. to daunt me quite a bit. But he was in the group. And one day, Jerry Jeff 
poked his head into a band rehearsal, and it was instant band. And he said, you know, I got some songs. Also, a lot of them written in Red River. That's where I really got to know Jerry Jones. And uh, High Hill Country Rain, Charlie Dunn, Old Beat Up Guitar, some of those songs. Right. And uh, by this time, you know, Murphy had handed me a bass guitar. So suddenly I'm no longer a folky, right. but I'm playing bass and played bass on his records. And Jerry Jeff said, look, I've gotten songs too. Will you cut stuff with me? So we went into the studio in Austin and we, we recorded both Austin and New York and recorded the first Jerry Jeff MCA record just called Jerry Jeff. It's a brown album, has LA Freeway, High Hill Country Rain. We didn't know what we were doing. It was loose <laughs> as a goose. And these sessions, you know, we would, we would show up at these sessions and Jerry Jeff had this big metal tub and he'd fill it full of sangria and, and this whole sangria recipe that he had, you know, <laughs> oranges and apples and pour it all in this and mix it all up and we'd start drinking sangria about six in the afternoon and by about eight or nine o'clock is when we'd start cutting. Where are you recording at? We were recording at this place, it was, it was an old cleaners, old okay. dry cleaners that had been renovated into a studio, yet. In, in Austin? In Austin. Okay. High ceilings, burlap all over the walls, no board, no uh, actual, it's just one giant room with a 16 track tape recorder right. sitting over in the corner, no board, everything plugged straight into the recorder. Looking at the VU meters. You would just set the levels. Set the levels to, to listen to a playback took, was so involved <laughs> that we didn't listen to playback. You just record it. We would record it and, and go, and you just do like a set right. and try things and then at the end of the night listen to everything and come back the next night and do it over again. Wow. So it captured this real live feel. Everything was live. Uh, we just recorded it and learned the songs and recorded it at the same time. You're and recording that a full band? At that? Is that a full band? Full band. Full band set, recording 16 tracks with no mixer, just setting the meters like if it hits a snare and you set that so it doesn't doesn't, doesn't over, overdrive. Overdrive. One at a time. That'd be. That sounds like a recording nightmare. It, it was, but those it, are magical sessions, though. There were magical sessions, and Michael Brodsky, who was Jerry Jeff's manager from New York, had brought some sound reduction, noise reduction, down, and kind of plugged that in. So we did have a little bit of that. Right. But there was really no way to listen to these recordings, and and that set the pattern for Jerry Jeff's recording style of doing it on the fly, from then on. Because the next record we made was uh, Viva Trilingual. And that was Big recorded one. in the Luke and Bog Dance Hall. But with a world-class recording studio that one of the two in the country at that time, Jerry Jeff found. It was Dale Ashby and Father is what it was called. And they had a mobile unit they drove Big out there? Big mobile unit. They came to New York, came down to from New York to, to Luke and Bog. Imagine those guys from New York pulling into Luke and Bog. They have no good electricity. They had to get the, <laughs> the electric company to come out and set up new, those big... Because this is 72, 73? This is like the... This 70, is like 70, 73 by this yeah, time. Okay. And an interesting, you know, anytime you want to jump in... You no, know, no, I, I mean, you're, you're doing great. I, I will say, you're watching the Honky Tonk Happy Hour, and we're very pleased to have Bob Livingston one of the founding members of the Los Gonzo band, maybe the founding member, would you say? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah. kind of. Me and Gary Nunn, and um, there's about five guys in the original band, but then about 20 have filtered in and out of the band. Is that fair to say? It's, it's fair to say. When we made the re Murphy recordings, uh, the first Geronimo's Cadillac recording was myself, Murphy, Gary Nunn, and they overdubbed Kenny Buttry on drums, I think, which was a big Nashville session guy. And Leonard Arnold, who was also from Austin, played the electric guitar and a few other things. They took it to, uh, uh, Bob Johnson produced it, put it all together, and they put it out. The second album we did with Murphy, we were still with Murphy, but Jerry, Je meanwhile, we had cut the Jerry Jeff album. Viva Terra Lingua? No, the, 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 first, the first one. one. Jerry, uh, the first one, called Jerry the, Jeff. Well, the no mixer for record. So it's like <laughs> both yeah. juggling back and forth. We go to Nashville to cut this, the second Murphy album, which was called Cosmic Cowboy Souvenir. And the band kind of broke up almost on the last downbeat, the last the recording note of, the, of the recording session. And we all went back to Texas to join back up with Jerry Jeff. Everybody that is but Gary Nunn. And Gary said, I need to kind of be with Mike and, 
and uh, I'm going to hang out. I'm going to cast my lot with him for a little longer. What, what happened? Can you talk about that? Well, can it was just let's, let's just say that it that had to do with uh, 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 you know Murphy is pretty intense, mm -hmm. and Johnson really liked me for some reason, and always wanted me in the band, but. Uh, when, when it was a, it was a thing where it was a very hard, hard time because Murphy had had nodules on his vocal cords and had had surgery, didn't speak for a few months, not a word. And we recorded, we we rehearsed the album at my house out on Lake Travis, and I sang it all. I sang all the. Murphy would come over to my house with a sheet of paper, and it, written on it would be. Here's a new song I wrote, it's called Blessing in Disguise. Come over to the piano, I'll play it and whistle the melody. I would go over to the piano and he'd go. It was a blessing in the... It was a blessing in the... He couldn't speak. He whistled the melody. I learned it. I would record, I would rehearse the band. Murphy right there playing the piano and making... I need a little more snare. You know, this kind of thing. It was really, I, I still have a lot of those. Was Murphy that, a piano player mainly back then? No, Murphy was a great guitar player, guitar player, but he could really play piano too. And whenever there was a chance, uh, like at a gig, and they had a piano there, he would get down like songs like Harbor for My Soul, which was just a rock and roll kick ass, you know, song. He played the piano on it. And he played the, and Gary Nunn also was a great piano player. Really? And uh, on this record, really, Gary had a song that he had co-written with Murphy called uh, Song of the South Canadian River. Drink life one drop at a time. Beautiful, beautiful melody. And Gary had written the music, Murphy had written uh, the words. Okay. And so Gary was kind of afraid that this song may be taken off the record if he didn't stick around. So he... He wanted to stay around to protect his song interest. He had in the his next song record. Interest. So yeah, we go you. back to Austin. Meanwhile... This is the end of 1972, the winter. Gary Nunn goes to England with Murphy to mix Cosmic Cowboy at Abbey Road Studios. Of all places. Why not? With the <laughs> London Philharmonic on a couple of tracks. Wow. And so it's, it's the worst winter in Europe in 20 years. And in those hotels, they would turn the steam heaters off to get people out on the street, walking around, get them out, get, a, get them out during the day, get them out, turn those heaters off. They had no power. So Gary was staying in the apartment block, and Murphy had put him up with some friends, and he was alone, and he was feeling bad. After the mix of the record, he was just depressed. And uh, one day he picked up his guitar, and 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 the first thing that came out of his mouth was, "It's cold over here," and I swear I I wish they'd turn the heat on. And who would think that a song coming from such a depressed beginning would become one of the quintessential Texas anthems? So he writes the song, London Homesick Blues. He comes back to Texas. Meanwhile, we've landed in Lukenbach. Found out Gary was back. I called him up, Jerry, Jeff called him up. You gotta come out here. We're having a great time. And Gary, now nah, I'm moving to Love. I'm, gonna, I'm going back to pharmacy school. <laughs> He was going back to school. We said, no, come out here, try it out. So he comes out and, and, uh, and in the course of us recording this album, Gary plays London Homesick Blues one afternoon. It's a fantastic song. Well, Home with the Armadillo. Home with the Armadillos. <laughs> yeah. And he has been using it for years. <laughs> that night at the, we would, the pattern was, same thing, sangria in the afternoon, start recording, we recorded sangria wine, getting by, pretty much live. That's what the, the sangria wine song essentially is about, it's about the big tub of a Big wine tub of sangria, drink. it's his It's his recipe. It's his special recipe. If you listen to that, you can make your own sangria just like Jerry Jeff Walker. That's the, actually <laughs> just a recipe, you know? No. That's funny. Of course, she throws some tacos and burritos in there, too. So. <laughs> it's the Honky Tonk Happy Hour. We're hanging out with Bob Livingston, and we're hearing some really cool stories about the entire cosmic cowboy movement that happened in the 70s, and you were right there in it. I wasn't kidding when I said that at the beginning, man. That's it's exciting, because I was a kid. You know, I'll be honest with you. I was about you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, but my brother-in-law was a record promo guy for A&M. Oh. So I was seeing these records come through, because he'd have these... Mad, 
trunk loads full of the trunk of his car would be full of just records, you know. And, and, and he, had, he was always in the record business, so I was seeing all this music and being exposed to it as a kid, and that's kind of influenced me as far as like that whole that whole outlaw country scene that came out of Austin. That, that yeah. I was growing up right in the middle of it, learned how to be a guitar player. Right. And I mean, I'm, I'm in my mid 40s now and I'm still whacking away at it. And guys like you are amazingly inspirational to me. Well, you know, I appreciate it. Mean, Thanks. So I wasn't just full of crap when I said that at the beginning. <laughs> I'm in it, you know. There's some other things I saw on the list here. I, don't, I mean, I know you could go on and on about that and I don't mean to hold you up, but there's a thing like Austin International Music Ambassador named by the city of Austin and you go around the world spreading music from Texas, and correct me if I'm wrong, to places all around the planet as an international, real, the real thing as a musical ambassador, right? 25 countries now. 25 countries. Uh, what happened was, is I was playing with Jerry Jeff, and my wife had moved, uh, had taken my kids, and they were in India, living in India. They'd go back and forth, and I was interested in it. I first went to India in 1981. Well, I went back in 85, and I had met a Fulbright scholar named Frank Block. I always give him credit because he, he really did it for me. And he told me about this program that the State Department had, that if you could convince him you're an expert in anything from legal aid to hydroponics to country music, you may get a gig out of it. Right. And so I uh, wrote Telegram, but back then there was no email, of course, and the phone system was worthless. Took you maybe three weeks to get a, write a letter to go across the country. Telegram. So I wrote a telegram to the U.S. Embassy in Delhi. I'm a musician from Austin. I'm here. I, I heard about this program. I'd like to be part of it. What do I have to do? They telegram back saying, uh, get to the nearest consulate or embassy. In my case, it was Madras. Okay. Took an all night train. John Inman, the great guitar player that played sure. with us, he was with me. We were both in India okay. when this happened. We go to uh, the U.S. State Department and uh, have this meeting with this guy. And, and I remember his name was Timothy Moore. He was just this straight-laced U.S. State Department uh, vice consul, public affairs officer. Right. And he was just looking at us and he said, well, what are you, you going to do? What would you do? And I said, well, the way I figure it is, I'll do a history of American folk and country music. And I will put you in the scene. I will tell stories about it. I'll do old cowboy songs. I'll do prison songs, work songs, bring it on up to union songs. Tell the story. The history of how it developed. The history of how it developed. Pretty much is like we all know it. Mm -hmm. But I had done some research uh, before Jimmy I got Jimmy Rogers there. and all Jimmy that. Jimmy Rogers, that Woody yeah, Guthrie. Yeah, 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 yeah. On up to, you know, country, modern day country music. And I'd throw in some rock and roll, do some Elvis, some Buddy Holly. Right and tell them that story and throw a few of my songs in every once in a while. So he said, okay, let's see what you got. So I played him a song, he didn't say a word, just kind of looked at me. And we started the second song and he stopped me in the middle and said, now wait a minute, do you mind? And he reached down and pulled out a banjo <laughs> and he said, I've been waiting for you to walk through this door for a long time. <laughs> And that's how it started. That's how he said, you come back next year and I will uh, put, we'll put you on the road. We came back in 1986 and John and I toured all over India. And uh, John went back, I stuck around, went into Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh. Uh, and over the years, every couple of years, I've gotten a tour. And I've, we went to the Middle East, uh, toured you know, Syria, Yemen, Kuwait. So Online. for how many years have you been doing this for now? 20? Well, since 1986, so what is it, 20? 25 years almost. 25 years. And uh, I just went to, we went to Africa last uh, November, December. I did uh, four countries in Africa. Now I understand you and your son are working on a project that's related to this. Well, we have shot, my, my son and I, over the, in, I guess in 1998, I bought a camera, a video camera. Nothing like you got here, but it was a it was a high eight digital camera, hey. and but it shot some great stuff, and we took it with us, and so we have over the years I've upgraded. Now I have a high def, little you know, Sony high def camera. I have one of those. <laughs> Went to Vietnam in in two thousand and seven, uh, Hanoi, you know, and shot video everywhere we go, and 
just on the fly, we... Um, it's like a travel log almost. It's a travel log, but when we would walk on stage, we're liable to give it to some guy standing there and just say, just get whatever you can. Yeah. And maybe one or two minutes or work, you know, but those one or two minutes are gone. That's how it works. That's how it works. You catch those little moments like that. Yeah. We got about 120 hours of video of 25 countries, and we're editing that down. You can go to YouTube. If you YouTube uh, Bob Livingston Not Fade Away, we got about a seven minute cut there. Or Bob Livingston in the Wild East, there's about 12 minutes. But the, the, the Not Fade Away cut is pretty good. My son put it together. And uh, it's us singing Not Fade Away in about 15 different countries and what they, how they react to it. It's a great message, you know, love is real, not fade right. away. Right. So, yeah, and, and over the years as I've gone back and forth to play with Jerry Jeff or whoever, I played with Ray Hubbard and, and I would, I would kind of go back and do these foreign tours. You know? Plus, as a studio guy, I noticed on your thing, you've just been with a ton of people. All those Flatlander buddies of yours from yeah. up in Lubbock, you played on every one of their records, it looks like, at one point or another, it seems like. Uh, you played well, on Terry Allen's record. Uh, maybe not every one of Flatlanders, no, but I'm no, saying. No, no, I, I played on Butch Ray Hancock's records. I played on Terry Allen records. Uh, Pat Green, Corey Morrow, uh, a lot of those Texas guys. Steve Fromholz. Steve Fromholz did a lot of that stuff. Played bass, and I've also sung a lot of uh, their vocals, background vocals. That's, yeah. That whole West Texas scene is a. Uh, I have family from up there as well. I yeah. have family from in Littlefield and in yeah. Tohoka. Oh yeah. oh yeah. In Tohoka, my uh, my family, my, the big claim to fame is my great grandfather, who I'm named after. Uh, he brought the railroad to Tohoka, and, oh. and now it's a dying little town. It's sad. I drove through there too long ago. It's barely there anymore. Yeah. But uh, I know. is but, the railroad still there? The railroad's still there, but uh, the town's just barely there. But uh, but no, I mean, just so much of that music comes up out of there. What do you think it is? There's something in the water up there, you guys? <laughs> they did a whole documentary about it called Lubbock Lights. I don't know if you've seen it. I don't know. I've seen it. It's, it's um, what it, why did this happen? And, and uh, the Flatlanders, of course, are really prominent in it. I'm in it. I do a cameo telling how I first met Ely. Crazy story. But uh, Terry Allen, and they do a lot of talking about what it, they interview a lot of musicians mm -hmm. and a lot of local folks. And they talk about the Lubbock Lights, which was a phenomenon, kind of like the Marfa Lights, which, you know, spaceships. And I saw them. I saw, saw it. I saw the spaceship myself. I saw a flying saucer. You saw a flying saucer in Lubbock, Texas. I saw it. Right you, heard, over, you heard it, folks. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> right in front of my eyes, go over my head, and, uh, you know, there's no doubt, there was no doubt about it. But now, I was uh, in a hailstorm once in Lubbock. <laughs> and the hail was this big. I'm not Man. kidding. They seeded the clouds back then. They used to yeah. seed the clouds back in the right. 70s yeah. back then. And it was, we had to pull into like a... One of those <laughs> grain hanger, not, not a silo, but like a big warehouse where they keep cotton and so forth out yeah. there. And I mean, my dad was freaking out because it was like, you know, it was putting Are dents you in trying to say that it wasn't a spine saucer, but it was a hailstone? It might have been a big hailstone. No, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> it I mean, could be. But the Lubbock Lights, essentially, they... They, they a, talked about the Lubbock Lights, and, and, uh, and, and so it gets down when they interview... Uh, that's a funny part of the of the of the documentary when they they talk about uh they they're talking to Terry Allen and he says, I think what it is is aliens. That's the reason that this has all happened for us. And uh, they just and then Butch Hancock talks about yeah they just sprung up out of the cotton fields these aliens, <laughs> and uh, that's why we've you know written all these crazy songs and why there's so much music out there. And now, I believe Terry Allen saw some aliens. <laughs> I'm just saying. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the Honky Tonk Happy Hour coming to you live from the hideaway. We're hanging out with Bob Livingston. It's really cool.